All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Daniela Labate and I work for NIAPRS and we are an adult MECTAC Plus partner. So on behalf of all of the partners, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the third webinar in our Solutions That Work series, Integrating Behavioral Health and Primary Care. So just some quick housekeeping before we get started um, on the content. Today's webinar is being recorded and you can access that recording usually in about 48 hours on the MCTAC website. We have set aside some time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, so I'd like to encourage you to please use the chat box feature throughout the webinar and type in your questions to all panelists. And as a reminder, the information that you receive today is current as of today's date. So this is our MCTAC and CTAC partner slide. And here you see the adult MCTAC Plus partner slide. And as MCTAC Plus partners, we work together to provide individualized and hands-on training and technical assistance to adult behavioral health providers throughout New York State on the successful transition to Medicaid managed care. For some reason, I am not able to advance the slides. Um, today's presenters are from Hudson River Healthcare and Helio Health. So I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to them before I pass the ball over. Terry Haynes is a nurse practitioner at Hudson River Healthcare. She's been in practice for over 35 years and has received her Doctor of Nursing degree from Case Western University in Ohio in 2007. She's been at Hudson River Healthcare for the past year as the sole primary care provider for the Access Behavioral Health Facility in Middletown, New York. And Eileen McManus is the Vice President of Operations at Hudson River Healthcare. She's worked at Hudson River Healthcare for the past 15 years and she oversees the operation of the 19 health centers in the Hudson Valley, including the Middletown location and the mobile unit. Eileen participated in the development of the integrated model housed at Access Supports for Living and the innovation grant that utilizes the mobile unit. Jeremy Klemanski is the President and Chief Executive Officer at Helio Health and the Helio Health Foundation. He's been with the organization since 2005 and received his MBA from the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University. And as you can see, he served um, or currently serves on several work groups and boards of directors and advisory boards across the state. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to Eve Addis. Eve will be the moderator for our panel discussion today. He's worked in the behavioral health field for over 20 years in both residential and outpatient services and is quite well versed in the area of health integration. So I wanna thank all of our presenters and now I'm gonna turn it over to them so that they can give us a little bit of background on their organizations um, and what they're doing in the area of integrating physical and behavioral health. And then we'll have a facilitated panel discussion um, before we open it up to um, you guys, our listeners for some questions. So. Terry and Eileen, why don't you um, go ahead and get us started and I will advance this next slide and pass the ball over to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, we wanted to take a moment to just talk about the many ways in which we have uh, previously and currently integrated behavioral health into primary care in Hudson River. One of those ways, as you see here, is the impact model for collaborative care and depression treatment that we have used currently in operation at three sites in the Hudson Valley and then one in Suffolk County. We incorporate psychiatric consultants, depression care managers, and primary care champions, such as a nurse manager, into the clinical care team in that model. A co-location model for integrated behavioral health and primary care delivery is in operation already at almost 25 sites in the Hudson Valley and Suffolk County. It includes the depression screening that is done, GAD, and expert screening, referrals, and warm transfers to on-site behaviors. We're happy to say that we were, have been able to have social workers on-site in our primary care setting for a number of years and how beneficial that's been for our teams, for our patients, uh, in terms of um, a holistic approach to care. So today we're going to focus primarily on the embedded model that is underway here at Access Supports for Living 
and Terry is the provider, um, as she noted earlier in that particular setting. In Long Island as well, in Suffolk County, we do have primary care embedded in an Article 31. Uh, we've been fortunate in, in the Hudson Valley in being um, the recipient of, a, of an innovation grant that has allowed us to begin to use our mobile unit to support um, service delivery to our behavioral health partners, clients who have gaps in care in terms of lab work. And we have used that mobile unit to uh, travel to some of our behavioral health partners and work very closely together in order to ensure that a number of um, clients or patients at risk are able to receive care on that mobile unit. In Long Island, uh, it's a little bit different. It's a really um, primarily focused on the behavioral health uh, providers there and able to uh, provide preventive care as well. In the Hudson Valley, we're focused primarily on labs and gaps in care. And then, of course, we have Health Home. Um, so we are the largest lead health home agency in New York State. And we have our care management agency that uh, works with clients both in the Hudson Valley and in Long Island. And uh, Jeremy, we'll pass the slide to you. If there are any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. So Helio Health is a, a behavioral health organization that uh, began its integration efforts a couple of years ago. Um, just for some background and perspective, um, we're a smaller organization than the one you just heard from. Um, we have four divisions, inpatient, outpatient, residential, aftercare, training institute. Our, our hubs are in Syracuse, Rochester, Binghamton, uh, and as of next week, Utica. We have about 509 beds in operation of bedded care, a um, little over 500 staff colleagues that service these programs, and um, we're on the smaller side in terms of health care, but in terms of behavioral health care, we're a moderate-sized organization in New York in terms of uh, budget. Um, to give you some perspective, our reach uh, last year was a little over 7,000 patients that we worked with. Our services are fairly comprehensive uh, in terms of behavioral health, uh, inpatient withdrawal and stabilization, inpatient rehab, uh, CCBHC, um, which encompasses the substance use and mental health disorder um, treatment clinics that were previously integrated before CCBHC. Um, and did some, some primary care, but not as integrated as they are today, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, gambling addiction treatment, child and adolescent services, uh, opiate treatment programs, uh, mobile health outreach through the Center of Treatment Innovation Project, Regional Open Access Center for Addictions, Community Residences, Supportive Living, Permanent Housing, Case Management Recovery Services, HCBS, uh, Training Institute, and then Peer Engagement Services and Wraparound and Hospital Diversion Services, uh, just to kind of give you some perspective of what's available. And, you know, what we've really uh, been focused on organizationally in terms of our innovations um, the last few years is what, where we, what we did in the inpatient side of the house was um, take our outpatient services, integrate them from a mental health SUD perspective, and they both had some primary care. But when we put them together, uh, and put the primary care teams together, they, they were all finally communicating uh, with each other, which made a huge difference. Um, we converted to the CCBHC uh, model in 2017. And what that's done is allow us to hire more primary care physicians um, part-time in multiple care settings uh, and they screen for other health conditions. And what we've been doing is then training them in SUD and mental health screening so that they can take that back to their practices as well. What that's done is interesting. We now have um, primary care practices in our region working with us to figure out how we can co-locate our behavioral health specialists, um, master's level social workers uh, for the most part, um, case acts as well as peers in their practices so that um, their patients can get at least basic screening and basic supports in that environment. And then for folks who are more acute, 
they would continue to refer them uh, to the hub of the CCBHC. Um, one of the interesting things we've done is when we've taken a look at what the unmet health needs of our patients were, we noticed that women's health was a particular area of need, so we hired an OBGYN. Um, this took a lot of time. We had to find an OBGYN who also uh, was interested in working with this population, and we got incredibly uh, lucky because we finally recruited one who had also worked in an STD setting uh, prior to being an OBGYN. Um, brought that person on um, to work on our OTP clinic, which is co-located with our integrated SUD mental health and primary care services that are, that are adjunctive to that. And he's now doing um, other women's health screenings for all the patients. Uh, that led to a recent application and the uh, bringing on board of a women's health coordinator who is now working to coordinate the care um, for the women that are in our services uh, with the different respective women's health practices in the area um, to make sure that they do receive specialty follow-up when they screen positive for um, specific conditions um, and, and also to help make sure that their health education, testing, and follow-up is uh, consistent. We've hired psych NPs. This is something we've done more in, we've done this in outpatient. We've also been doing this in inpatient and other settings um, where we realized that psych NPs would be particularly helpful for us um, because of their ability to prescribe medications. Um, and we were putting them in settings uh, to screen for mental health and also other basic health screenings uh, so that they can address those concerns. And that while those programs are not designed, uh, especially the inpatient ones, to meet those other needs long-term, um, they can then make sure that there is coordination of care and that as part of the discharge process from those programs, we're doing referral and engagement work for primary care external to the behavioral health uh, inpatient setting. Um, increasing the use of NPs across all of our settings, um, especially where primary care physicians were not available has been very helpful. And something that seems relatively simple, probably to most people listening, but one of the things that's yielded the greatest impact is buying vehicles and literally just taking people to appointments um, when they are external to our system uh, for specialty follow-up care when they screen positive for acute uh, or other chronic conditions. That's been, I mean, it seems like such a simple thing, but um, what we've found is that with folks that are cognitively impaired, um, transportation and navigation can be a barrier to accessing care. As we think about how we train, engage, and measure, um, We've found that training staff colleagues has been incredibly important, and we've found that that has to kind of be a multi-pronged approach. Um, we can have trainings and do webinars, um, but that's only a part of it. We have to, we've learned we have to prime the topic with, um, you know, papers, um, sometimes as simple as an email with an interesting statistic or research fact that we've noticed from our own uh, work, um, posters, discussions, um, targeted discussions and staff meetings, which otherwise are either very clinical or very management focused, um, trying to blend those uh, and making sure that we're talking about um, overall health condition uh, topics has been really important to helping get the staff um, kind of, if you will, whet their appetite for those trainings and for some deeper work in that area. Um, we've used other specialty health groups um, to do topics, uh, topical trainings. Um, so rather than try to be the expert on everything, uh, we've partnered with a number of other health organizations in the region to come in and train as well. Um, that training created, has created awareness, and that awareness seems to very naturally activate the desire to help our patients. Um, you know, if we think of the people who work in behavioral health settings, they're, they're very mission-focused uh, folks. And as soon as you activate uh, their understanding with knowledge about how they might do a great job of counseling somebody, but if we don't deal with these other health conditions and don't help the patients be aware of it, it's going to negatively impact their health and exacerbate or likely lead to um, them coming out of remission from their substance use or mental health conditions that we've been trying to treat. Uh, it, it just seems to naturally activate their desire to make sure that that engagement and follow-up is happening. Um, the engagement with payers is still a work in progress, but CCBHC has allowed us to scale this work with primarily the Medicaid population. Um, and so what we've seen is that the CCBHC model having a more inclusive rate and being able to hire more primary care physicians 
uh, to the staff, um, it has really allowed us to, to see more of an impact and do more with the staff. Um, I would say in terms of measuring, the thing that we have found to be probably most important is measuring um, fidelity to screenings, making sure that they're happening um, across all eligible or affected populations. Right now, our screening success rates in terms of engagement are just over 90% or 100% for some conditions. And we look at them on a recurring basis to figure out, okay, where are their gaps and why are some people not screened? Uh, and then how do we fix systems? Is it an EHR system? Is it a process flow system? Um, and so we've done a lot of work on uh, process maps and workflows to really make sure that all the preventative screenings that we think um, patients should have uh, that are indicated as appropriate for their population are happening. Um, and again, the other thing I would say to you is then the back end of that is once you're screened, um, we then measure what it, what's done with the results. Um, and we're regularly looking at the percentages of, okay, was a health education session uh, conducted with the patient? Did we help educate? Did we not just hand the patient their lab results or their screening results, but did we really walk them through what these results mean, um, help them understand the condition uh, or the risk factors they're demonstrating? And then what have we done um, post that moment to measure follow-up? Um, are we assigning case managers to make sure that appointments are happening? Um, are we offering transportation to those appointments, uh, which we found to be very helpful? And the more that uh, seems to expand, the more vehicles we try to buy as long as funding is available. Um, and we see that the more vehicles and case managers we have, the better those adherence rates get to follow up on that. Because again, with this really chronic and cognitively impaired population, um, it's really important that we help facilitate access to that care. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is Eve Addis, and uh, I, I have to say that uh, you both, uh, all, all of you, presented a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information, and I'm I'm going to sort of try to uh, put it together in some way and ask you some some questions, and maybe we can go a little deeper. So uh, to start with, you know, one of the challenges, I guess that uh, exist in sort of the bringing these two disciplines together in an integration, a whole person model of, of service uh, is uh, orienting each discipline to the other. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, and if we can start with, with Teresa and Eileen, uh, how did you convince, for example, the primary care practitioners uh, that depression uh, was a, a factor uh, for their effectiveness as primary care practitioners? Well, um, this is uh, Teresa Haynes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have been working in primary care for many, many years, and depression is so common that um, I don't know that it takes a lot of convincing uh, for me to feel that doing a PHQ-9 is a useful tool. Um, maybe I'm not understanding the question very well. Well, for example, you're, you're working with other physicians, right, in, in, in a number of ways to get them to understand or to get them to appreciate that, you know, you, you, in your experience, I get it, you, you're already sold. But how do you get other uh, primary care practitioners uh, to, to kind of uh, appreciate that depression in their patients may have an impact on their effectiveness as doctors? I think from my other experience, not really so much in my current position, but in my prior experience, I think primary care folks feel a little bit um, troubled or uh, a little bit lost without having a direct connection to behavioral health practitioners. So I think once you connect the behavioral health to the primary care, I think practitioners are much more likely to buy into doing screenings if they feel like they have the backup from behavioral health specialty to treat their patients. 
that would be the best way I would explain it. Okay. And, Jeremy, in your in your shop, uh, when you talk about, um, you know, your MH and uh, substance abuse practitioners, uh, and you mentioned that, you know, you, you provide training, uh, I'm wondering, uh, for them, uh, sort of entering into this world of primary care, uh, what did you do specifically? Uh, what did you use specifically in terms of training tools? But how did you get them to buy into this idea that they would have to expand their practice to inquire and um, assist their patients with their primary care health? So it, it really was a combination of creating awareness and um, helping them understand um, that they and their primary care colleagues who they were previously more disjointed from, um, that they have th really the same goals. Um, the goal is health improvement. Uh, the goal is not just arresting a specific condition or risk factor. Um, helping them understand that is, you know, one of the conversations I had with some of our colleagues one day was I said, you know, think of how hard you work. And I said, you know, and, and everybody believes they work hard. And, and I think a lot of people in our spectrum do uh, work incredibly hard trying to help people improve their lives, improve their health. And I said, now, Think about the fact that if we don't address these other conditions, these folks are going to die at a much younger age than they otherwise might. Just think for a moment about how hard you've worked. And you work that hard because of how much you value them and their life, okay? And many people have very personal connections uh, to, to, to patient care, especially in the behavioral health sector where there tends to be uh, a high rate of recovery from the specific conditions being, uh, you know, trying to improve or, or, or ameliorated. And so every, that resonates with everybody and they, they get it. And they said, okay, so the trick is to figure out how to help them learn to do the different types of screenings, who's appropriate, and then bringing those staff into the team. So one of the ways we did it was as we were hiring um, folks uh, into our medical team, um, even in the SUD mental health services, we started looking for people who had specific uh, subspecialties in primary care, women's health, um, general internists, um, folks who um, could learn uh, the specific protocols maybe for detox or for substance use disorder treatment, could get their waivers for prescribing, um, you know, and that we could kind of, kind of blend those teams and, and train them and help them realize that they have a lot more in common than they have um, not, if you will, and that helped a lot. So basically helping them realize that they have the same goals, helping them realize that each of their work is impacted in a positive way by working together has kind of helped make that blend happen. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm now going to shift a little bit to the people you serve. And uh, the question here is really about, you know, a person comes in, whether they're coming in for primary care uh, on, in, in the health or they're coming in primarily for, um, you know. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. You can't hear me? Again now, yes. Okay, what? Um, okay, I'll back up. You're, you know, you're fading in and out. Sorry. Okay, I don't know why. Uh, Jeremy, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. So I, I don't know that it's on my end, but uh, okay. I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Thank uh, you. So what I'm what I'm what I'm referring to here is the person or the people you serve and how uh, they react to uh, this change to whole person care because typically somebody coming into a behavioral health clinic expects something, and somebody going into primary care expects something, and when they walk into your setting, they're getting well, more than they expected, but maybe a little bit surprised and put off. So I'm wondering what you did as an organization to engage, uh, to get the people you serve on board that in this place, in this setting, uh, we're going to do both. We're going to address all of you, not just part of you. So Teresa and Eileen, if you could take that first. Sure. 
I would say that, you know, from the beginning, we knew that we wanted to prepare or set the stage for our arrival. And we began, once we had a target date of uh, going live, to begin to um, share in this space that would be new to us and to a, a base of uh, patients that would be new to us, the fact that we were coming and what it is we were bringing. And, of course, that it, it meant also engaging staff in the process as well. Um, once we opened our doors, we were able to be present three days a week. And it's one thing to go into an exam room, and it's another thing to, or to see a, a kind of announcement on the wall to say primary care is here. It's another thing to actually see and meet the people. So we would do things like blood pressure screening or flu shots in the reception area to kind of ensure that people who came in for their behavioral health services uh, realized that we were there, who we were, that we were friendly faced. Um, we've also participated, Terry has uh, participated in a series of lunch and learns uh, with the clients who may not necessarily have come to us in the beginning, but over time they've come to know who she is, to recognize her, and to be drawn to the primary care setting that's here in, in the behavioral health section. So those are some of the things that we've done, and here's Terry to add to that. I think a big part of it, from my point of view, is the patients were used to coming to this site for their behavioral health, and once they learned that they could have a primary care visit on the same day, we try to facilitate same-day appointments. So literally the patient I had first thing this morning got here a little late because of a transportation problem. He had his behavioral health appointment, so we said, fine, you go to your behavioral health appointment and you can come and see us immediately after because we're literally on the same hallway as his behavioral health provider. So the co-location has really facilitated their ability to um, take care of two needs in one visit, and I think the patients really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have a follow-up question to this um, uh, after we give Jeremy a chance to kind of respond to, to this issue. So one of the things that helped us a lot was we're, one of the things we do at Helio Health is we try to think of the experience from the moment you Google search us or call us to the moment you walk in the front door. So in terms of integration and in outpatient, we built um, a new outpatient clinic a few years ago, um, right about the same time we were planning to do a lot of these things. And when we built that clinic, we designed it uh, after we put some focus groups together, and those focus groups were designed around a couple of things. First, we met with a number of staff and patients and families and said, tell us about the best primary care practice you've ever visited. Describe it to us. And we wrote down all those characteristics. And then we did the same focus group separately um, with, with those same cohort of people and said, tell us about the best behavioral health experience you've ever had. Tell us about your favorite clinic or the best experience. Um, and then we, of course, did some groups with separate people. And we put all the common factors together, and we met with our architect, and we designed an outpatient clinic that when you, when you come in the front door, you come into um, a waiting area that is more like a primary care health practice or, or, or an urgent care setting than a typical behavioral health clinic. And when you go into, um, there are multiple entry and exit points from this waiting room. And when you go in through the main one for your initial assessment, if you're here for the first time, um, medical, and medical, medical examination is part of that process. And when you walk through that door, what you walk into is the medical suite, which is in, literally in the middle of the clinic. Everything else is built around the back of the medical suite in a U shape, all the different wings of counseling, group rooms, et cetera, et cetera. And if, when you walk into that medical suite, um, it looks like a primary care practice. Um, there's uh, eight exam rooms, um, a number of testing bathrooms, a nursing station, kind of triage suite in the middle. Um, and so from the very moment you walk through the door, you realize that this is, this is healthcare. And, and these people are going to be looking at more than um, just the traditional uh, behavioral health talk therapy and medication-assisted treatment that I might have experienced somewhere else. 
So we, we tried to um, help people participate in their care by conditioning them to what it was they were going to experience visually and experientially before we really even start talking to them. We found that if we can set the stage with the right props, the words are, are supported by their visual and their kind of physical experience. I'm wondering, I mean, that, that's really, a, you know, a, a very interesting approach. Um, uh, and, and I'm wondering, once, you know, the rubber hit the road, in other words, that you actually started uh, delivering services in an integrated way, either of you can take this question. Um, did you find that there was any any of your clients who um, expressed some concerns about privacy uh, in terms of, you know, that they may not want certain kind of information uh, to be shared, or as part of your orientation, do you do you both? Oh, I just lost them. Oh, that all their information, behavioral health data information, and medical would be shared across the board. How do you handle that, that privacy? Teresa and Eileen, you want to start? Uh, sure. Terry's going to respond. When the patient signs up to, to get primary care with me, they're basically given a lot of information, some of which includes consent forms to share information with the behavioral health organization. Because even though I'm physically present in the behavioral health building, I actually work for a different organization, HRH Care. This is not their facility. So the patients need to sign and consent to share information. Sometimes they'll consent to just share basic medical information, and sometimes they're willing to share the whole range of information, including um, HIV status and substance abuse status and things like that. But they're given the opportunity to consent one way or the other what can be shared and what can't. What I've found is the vast majority of patients are willing to share everything. There's a few people here and there that have exclusionary feelings about things, but most of them really want everything shared. And uh, Jeremy, on your end, how, how does that play out? We, we, in our case, because it's internal, it's, it's integrated and we do releases for everything. There, there is some information that's sensitive and occasionally patients may want some information segregated and there's a way within their uh, chart that that can happen. Um, but what we've basically explained to people is that this is your care team, right? So this doctor, this nurse, this, this psychiatrist, this counselor, um, you know, your LMS or LCSW who's doing a lot of your talk therapy or your psychiatrist, um, they only can be effective if they're working together. I mean, they can have limited effectiveness individually. They collectively have more effectiveness and so we, we basically help the patient understand when they're signing releases as part of their initial intake work that these are releases for a unified uh, charting system for the most part. And then unless they specifically ask us to keep something separate, um, that, that it's really not to their advantage to do that. Um, and it's not common for our patients to, to disagree with that logic. They, they seem to understand it and they seem to, I mean, usually it's more of an expression of, you know, wow, you guys really care enough to make sure that all these other things are being looked at and and making sure that I'm getting meds. I mean, one of the things we did was we noticed that in these conversations, patients are actually concerned uh, about their, you know, medication, for example. They, they weren't so worried about people knowing what medication they had. They were more asking us, you know, how do I get my meds? So we, in our case, we were fortunate. We had this huge building and we were doing a lot of build-ups. We, we were able to put a pharmacy in the building. And um, yes, there are privacy concerns. So, for example, when they go over to the pharmacy, there's a separate waiting area. You know, there are ways to shield. You know, um, you know, so you know, it's not the same waiting room. So your your patient, other patients, other family, or a peer, or somebody that may have come with you to an appointment, they, they don't even see you go to the pharmacy. They only see when you come out of the clinic. So if they're giving you a ride or they're there for emotional support. You may have already tucked your medications into your, your, your purse or your pocket or whatever. Um, they don't even know your prescribed things. They don't, other folks aren't going to necessarily know 
what you're doing unless you choose to share that with them or you bring them into the appointment with you and, and, and waive uh, your privacy and confidentiality as part of that process. So uh, our experience has been that they actually want help and support, but for folks who want more privacy, we've, we've found some ways to make that happen for them. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to shift a little bit now to um, another uh, sort of me mechanism of an integrated model. Uh, that being um, the communication between practitioners. And, um, you know, I'm sure that, you know, this isn't left to chance in both of your settings. So can you describe um, how and what kind of strategies you use or you, you've set up, uh, what mechanisms you've set up um, to ensure that um, communication uh, is occurring in a way that is truly integrative and that is that truly results in improved uh, patient care. Uh, Jeremy, you want to take that one first? Sure. So for the most part, it's, it's an integrated EHR um, um, that prescribers, um, primary care physicians, uh, psychiatrists can send alerts to each other that might say, you know, for example, answer the counselor, say, hey, you know, you, you should take a look at this specific note from our last session. If they think there's something that really somebody should pay attention to, um, they, you know, we have a, a way of sending alerts within the system. Um, and um, other than when patients request specific segregation of certain charts and records, um, there is there's a way that a lot of those records are accessible to the clinicians. For external uh, sources, we have um, secure um, communication portals that we're part of with like local Rio and some other types of information exchanges that we're part of um, where folks can communicate with each other and say, hey, log in and look at this. You need to pay attention to this, um, kind of calling out certain things for them. Um, Clinicians get alerts, uh, counselors get alerts when new labs and other things are downloaded into the patient's chart, so they know to check different things. So we basically tried to create alert-like systems, let people know to look at the integrated record and make sure they're aware of what's going on. Do you do any uh, sort of the care planning? Is, how do you handle, you know, integrated care planning? Um, a little bit more complicated. Um, sometimes you have to actually get the people in the room. Um, sometimes that's not as simple to do, uh, in you know, in terms of electronic communication, because uh, there's a you know, as you all know, there's a lot of nuance and things that are lost with electronic communication. So um, uh, integrated teams get together and go over patients and work when they're working on their care plans. Um, it's a it's a uh, kind of a cross-populated team. Uh, uh, physicians, uh, nursing, uh, counseling. Um, sometimes we even have toxicologists involved at times. To, to, if there's something in the, the labs that they're not 100% sure people would understand exactly what is going on. Um, so it's a, it's a really a, a cross-functional team that has to get together and kind of look at the outline of the plan that may have been put together by their care manager or their primary care uh, person or their primary counselor and then make sure that all the other stuff that would be seen as adjunctive is really integrated in terms of the plan itself. And sometimes that requires editing and, and revision. Does, does the same, uh, you know, I'm gonna, you know, go a little further here. Does this same uh, sort of integrated team uh, conduct sort of meet, do they need to manage risk as well if you have somebody who is higher risk uh, but that is it that same team that gets together to to address that in in a care plan yes but if it's a, if it's specific um, situations to specific patients then it sometimes is just a very quick uh, they might do a quick huddle um, you know through a, a quick internal conference call or they might quickly all huddle in in a, in a office or room in the nursing area or in uh, the counseling area um, it, it really depends on the patient and, you know, what the situation is. Um, and, and in some of those cases, if there's concern about adherence or showing up for things or, you know, then we might even bring the pharmacist into the conversation or 
uh, in some cases, uh, targeted case managers around transportation issues and making sure that we're following up to get them to that appointment. You know, so it depends on what the condition is, but sometimes that group becomes expanded then to bring in those additional um, collateral supports. Thank you. Uh, Teresa and Eileen now, in terms of your shop, um, how, how I'm sorry, we lost you. What routine do you have in place? Mm -hmm. to no, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I said, in your shop, what is it that you do uh, routinely uh, to ensure that uh, communication is happening in a way that um, really is beneficial to the pa to patient care? Um, well, like I said, I joined an organization that was already existing, so I was the new member of the team. But when I came initially, there was a care manager that was assigned to come every morning to join our huddle. It would be myself, my nurse, the care manager, and our patient representative. And we would go through the patients that were scheduled for that day. And she had been working for this organization for quite some time, so she really had a personal connection to many of the patients and could give us some insight as to what their needs were and what their, their challenges were. Uh, so that was on a daily basis. Then probably about twice a month, sometimes more, I would meet with the, all the therapists because they have monthly meetings. And during those meetings, they would discuss the at-risk clients, and I would then give input from the medical side about what problems they were having or what kind of concerns that I had. And in addition, all of the people working here were very open and willing to have me knock on their door to discuss individual cases when I would find a concern. So it was really a three-pronged approach was, you know, through the care manager on the daily huddle, through the meetings with the therapist, and then individually I could, you know, knock on the psychiatrist's door and just have a discussion with them, you know, uh, sort of off the cuff. Uh, also, there was a nurse that was working here. She has since left, but a new person took her place. But when I was initially here, she also had worked here for many years, knew most of the patients by name, knew what their baseline was. So if I had a problem with someone, she could literally just come right in because the office was right next door and intervene. Uh, just as an example, I had a patient who is schizophrenic, collects cans outside to earn money, and he cut his hand and came in to me for the hand injury, and he had no idea when or if he had ever had a tetanus shot, and since he really didn't know me well, was very hesitant to have a tetanus shot, and when I brought in the nurse that knew him for years, he relented and, and got his tetanus shot and got his wound cleaned and was on his way. So it was very, very helpful for me, particularly in the beginning when I did not know the patient, to have these other staff members that already had relationships with them to come in and facilitate what needed to be done. Thank you. Uh, I, we, we have a couple of minutes, uh, so I'm going to give you a, a choice no. in terms of uh, the next question. Uh, and that is, if you would share with our listeners either uh, a barrier that you experienced uh, in your process of establishing an integrated model and how you resolved it, or uh, an important lesson that you've learned. And by that, I mean that there's something that you went in expecting uh, when, you were, when you were kind of envisioning this, and it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, and so, you know, that's sort of a lesson you learned, and uh, if you would share either a barrier or a lesson. And um, Jeremy, can you start us on that? So, yeah, I mean, we ran into a lot of barriers. Um, the biggest one we still run into um, was um, being able to, for us, it was being able to afford uh, the nursing and the primary care physicians pre-CCBHC, right? Um, because uh, traditional behavioral health, substance use disorder, community-based rates are very problematic. So for us, it was trying to figure out 
how do we blend and hire and train people that have a background um, in that area at what we could afford? We, we cured that with CCBHC. We also cured that with kind of scale and growth. Um, the I think the biggest barrier for us um, initially was people understanding that we weren't um, trying to become uh, the primary care experts in our community, but that we wanted to bring them in as colleagues, um, as partners. Um, and, in, and in other cases, we want to be able to put our uh, behavioral health experts in their clinics to support adjunctively what they're doing and, and then in a more integrated way as everyone becomes comfortable. In other words, you don't have to go in and start with full integration. You can start with um, providing some screenings and making referrals. It, you don't have to um, do everything at once, which could seem daunting, and you may not be able to afford, which in our case we couldn't. Um, you, you can ease into the water, and as you get more comfortable, uh, learn how to swim, and as you get better at it, um, it's interesting, you know, funds eventually do tend to flow to folks who have uh, better care. And over time, uh, because we were, for example, because we had done some integration work, we were eligible to become a CCBHC, for example. Um, and it made everything else we were trying to do easier, and, and then different rate structures became available to us. So I, I think the biggest barrier I would say sometimes is our own um, due diligence and seeing all the barriers and then not realizing that we can kind of just chip away at them a little bit at a time. Um, and then the other thing I would offer is when we did run into barriers, we found that if we talked, if we just talked, um, called or emailed the folks at Oasis or OMH, they were very open to, um, in some cases, I think there were some cases where we had to secure waivers, but, um, you know, they were very open to the discussion. It was basically, okay, tell us what you're trying to do. And once we told them we were trying to do, um, they either told us about a solution we didn't think of or they helped us kind of navigate how we would, how we would possibly uh, get a waiver if necessary or kind of work with them. Um, and, and, and in some cases, it just helped inform them about what the challenges with their own regulations might be. And on the OASIS side, where we're a little more focused at times, um, you know, we've even seen them change their regulations in the last few years based on recommendations that have come from providers like us. So for us, I guess I would say communication um, and not just not being intimidated by your own initial assessment of how uh, much of a challenge it might be to do this, uh, just doing it piece by piece. Thank you. That, that's, uh, that's really very helpful. Um, but Teresa and Eileen, uh, how about you, a lesson or a barrier that you've uh, encountered and resolved? Uh, the biggest barrier I would say that we ran into right from the beginning was that we don't share the same electronic medical record. So patients would come in for a visit and they really don't know what medications they're on or they don't know the doses, things like that. So what the uh, behavioral health organization was able to do was to give us access to their chart so that we could print out medication lists and diagnoses records so that that was available to me, and we have that now every morning when I start the day, I have the list of everyone who's coming in. And in addition, the Behavioral Health Organization was able to get me access to the HealthLink system so that when the patients get admitted to the hospital, I'm able to get, get into their hospital record and, and be able to review what happened in the hospital, what kind of lab work they had, and, and facilitate medical problems that maybe get lost because the patient may be living in a shelter or may really have, you know, intellectual deficits and they really can't follow up on their own. So as an example of that, just literally today I had a patient who was admitted for psychiatric reasons but during the admission process was found to have a lung mass and had a biopsy that showed that she had metastatic cancer but this, nothing had ever happened after her discharge because she really was not very clear about what the problem was or what needed to happen. And because I was able to see that health link information, that's how I knew that this had all transpired. And without that access, you know, she may not have gotten to treatment. And as of today, she has her appointment for Monday for the oncologist. So it really helps 
facilitate. Thank you for those examples. I think that those really those really hit home. I think for for a lot of us. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, for your candor and um, for a wealth of information that you provided. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, speaking with you today. I'm going to hand it now back to Daniela for uh, what questions from our listening audience. All right. Thank you, Eve, and thank you to Terry, Eileen, and Jeremy. Um, so I just want to give folks a chance to type in some questions. We had a couple that uh, came in during the presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and start you guys off on those, and then if folks have other questions, feel free to type them uh, in as we go along. So the first question um, is, can the presenters speak to how they keep momentum in health integration. So in other words, how do you keep both the behavioral health and the medical staff motivated to continue the collaboration process? So the, I, um, I would say that um, we meet on a regular basis and some of those, um, some of the things that we do together to ensure that we stand on common ground. For example, um, we have a health topic of the month and teams throughout Hudson River may dress in blue for a certain um, health modality that we're talking about. And the staff here in the Behavioral Health Center join up in that as well so that we feel the connection to one another that we're not separate and that sense of um, striving towards working together as an integrated full team. We are one, it's not HRH care in one place and access supports for living in another that we're that we're we're committed to that type of collaboration and in some fun stuff too, so that we're going to be celebrating holidays together and we're going to be doing all of those things together that help us to sustain the momentum. Great, thank you. Jeremy, did you want to add anything to that? Um, so we do two things. We use anecdotal stories of successes. We, we talk about failures. Um, we don't hide from them internally. Um, when we look at cases where um, somebody didn't have an ideal health outcome, we look back and if we see that they weren't screened or something didn't happen, we talk about that. And we ask, and we challenge our staff to think about whether or not uh, we could have done something different or better uh, for that patient. And one of the ways we do that is we look at the numbers, we look at the statistics, we look at the percentage of people screened and the, the follow-up and um, our CQI folks audit it, the programs themselves audit it. Audit it. We don't do it to punish or shame anybody. Uh, we don't do it in a you know, punitive type way. Um, we do it in, and we ask a very simple question at times, um, you know, if it was your family member, if it was your child, would it be okay if they didn't get the screening that best practice in our process has indicated they should have gotten? If they didn't get the kind of follow-up care that we would want with, you know, the best folks we could get them in to see, you know, would that be okay for us? And the answer is obviously no. And it keeps people very focused and we use the personal stories to help them connect and, and remind them of the humanity of the people we're serving and how much they are like our own family and in many cases because we have certain folks that are in recovery themselves or have experienced different health conditions, um, sometimes we'll even invite them to speak um, to our care teams to just remind them of how much impact it has on their life when these things are addressed. And we find that um, not being afraid to talk about the failures, um, celebrating and supporting the successes and keeping an eye on the numbers really kind of keeps keeps people moving in the right direction. That, that kind of, you kind of have to find a balance there. So I suggest you do all three. Don't hide from the failures, celebrate the successes and keep your eye on the numbers to make sure, you know, and audit it for, for fidelity. I think that's the combination that we have found works for us. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question, I guess, is for both of you as well. What advice um, can you give to smaller community mental health organizations who are looking to partner with um, health clinics or primary care providers? Where do they, where's a good starting place? This is Eileen. You know, I think um, everyone can recognize that relationships and communication are the key component to effectively. 
And some of the lessons that we learned along the way were um, to begin to be inclusive in inviting people to the table, especially line staff, who were going to be impacted by our presence. And we took us time to, to really understand that the customer service reps needed to be part of the equation and that some of the changes that were going to take place that were discussed um, at, at a different level, impact line staff throughout uh, our partner's space. And that uh, if we had it to do over, I think we would have um, brought those people in earlier on and made them part of uh, the plan. So um, one example was in this particular setting, there was glass that separated the, um, the patient rep from the from the clients and in our primary healthcare setting, that is not the case. Years ago, we had glass and we had removed it. So there was a certain anxiety about taking the glass down and being able to show, invite them into other spaces to see that it is something that can happen and it did happen here. And it has been um, a good change, but one that we probably should have incorporated that team into earlier on. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question. How do you exchange and review data on health outcomes among the team and with the agency or program leadership? Um, Jeremy, did you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, for, obviously we de-identify it for group analysis purposes. Um, we, we basically just query, we haven't integrated the HR, we just query the, the database for uh, what we're looking for, um, there's a certain amount of manual work that has to happen, um, and then we review it. So it's reviewed in a number of places. I get some metrics are actually re reviewed by our board of directors um, um, in program aggregate level, just so that they have some perspective on the progress we're making. Um, but at the program level, um, in the team, you know, there are team case reviews where they go over like a grouping of patients um, in, in those smaller um, care planning type team huddles. They may look at individual patients and their actual specifics. Um, but in terms of groups, we, we run reports monthly and quarterly. And if they're looking at something specifically, they run them weekly and just kind of look at what is the data telling them. And then um, they share the data with the team, um, either if it's a specific screening that's happening within nursing or the medical suite, or if it's something that's with the rest of the team, um, they, they might just go meet with the nursing team, or they might just meet with the physicians in their quarterly roundtable um, and talk about ways to improve that. Um, sometimes it's a discussion about workflow. Um, sometimes it's a reminder that a workflow wasn't followed. Unfortunately, that happens occasionally. Um, and sometimes it's really just about also looking at literature and figuring out is there a way to do something better. Um, so sometimes we'll do literature reviews, especially and that's, that's more prevalent with the, like the physician quarterly meetings and some other things where they're just trying to figure out how do we improve this. They'll go out and they'll query literature on how other people might be doing things and try to figure out is there a better way to do it. You know, um, should we consider a different screening tool that's easier to use? Is there, you know, so there's a constant, I would say there's like a constant review process that's going on that, that it, it's kind of like a, trying to feed it to always get better. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this question can go to either, either or both of you. Um, were any district funds used to implement integrated care in either of your settings? Uh, I'll, I'll take that in our case, almost zero. Okay. Other, yeah, other than some, I was going to say, other than some small bonus payments we received for re court reporting our data to the DSRIP, we have applied those monies directly to the clinics. Um, but we, in our case, we didn't receive specific funds to hire staff or for demonstration projects to change anything. Okay. And yeah. Eileen or Terry? For HRH care, um, district funds definitely help to support um, being embedded in this practice, and it also supports the um, innovation project with the mobile unit and our behavioral health care partners. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, it sounds, looks like we have time for literally one more question. Um, can you discuss any experiences with on-site case conferencing 
between primary care and mental health providers if you were not able to co-locate or embed? And if so, was that effective? So that question might be for you, Jeremy, because um, Hudson River Healthcare is embedded, so. Yeah, so all, all of our stuff is, you know, in terms of what's in, what's integrated in, in embedded, um, it's easy. They, they meet together all the time. Um, for the uh, cases where we're coordinating care for people outside, um, yes, there are times when it is hard. Um, there are times where uh, some physicians may not be as motivated to work uh, with our folks. Um, and you, but what we have found is usually if we're persistent, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make progress. I'll say something I don't, it's, it has a risk of being a little stereotyping, stereotypical, but we found that the nurses of those offices are often more receptive to some of that coordination of effort than the physician. So if you can get to the nurse, um, we have found that to be a, an effective conduit to the collaboration that needs to happen. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. So before we end, I just wanted to restate, since we got a question about this, um, about having copies of the presentation made available. So the presentation is being recorded and that'll be available for you on the MCTAC website in about, I would say by Monday. Um, so you can download the slides um, or listen to the, um, to the recording. So again, I just wanted to thank um, Eileen and Terry and Jeremy and of course Eve for facilitating the discussion today. Um, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Thank you.